Hello students, thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at soil. This is chapter 9 in our book. This lecture will help you understand soils and agriculture, a brief history of agriculture, and soil science fundamentals. So agriculture can be defined as the practice of cultivating soil, producing crops, and raising livestock for human use and consumption. I put livestock in, in italics because it's not usually what first comes to mind when we say agriculture. Usually people just think of crops. 38% of Earth's surface is used for agriculture in the way of croplands used for growing plants and rangelands for, gro for grazing animal livestock. This graph is just showing that population is closely linked to food. As population is rising, it's um, also following the trend of food production rising. And since the early 1900s, through industrial agricultural techniques, synthetic fertilizers, and what we call the Green Revolution, which we'll learn about next week, food production has increased remarkably throughout the last 100 years. Soils are becoming degraded in many regions and we're seeing lots of examples of soil erosion and something called desertification where the soil really is not very fertile anymore, not, not very good for growing new um, crops. And we see this happening in our country, areas of serious concern, the area that we call the breadbasket of the U.S., happening a lot in Europe where there's been intensive agriculture for a while. A little FYI with this graph, Europe seems to have the highest total area with degraded soil. And part of that is because of its long history of intensive agriculture. But Asia and Africa are catching up. What are causes of soil degradation? From this graph we can see that the biggest one is overgrazing. Letting animals destroy or consume too much vegetation to the point that it can't grow back. Deforestation, cutting down forests, um, contributing to erosion of soil. Cropland agriculture, uh, in this case um, related to the planting of monocrop or monoculture, where you have an entire field full of one crop, like an entire wheat field or an entire corn field, that also doesn't lend itself to soil health. And over-exploitation and industrialization. But the first three are the big, big ones overgrazing, deforestation, and cropland agriculture. A little FYI about the origins of agriculture. We, we know from archaeology that these areas in green are areas where um, agriculture developed independently. These other areas may be possibly independent or maybe related to these other areas. But the important thing to point out here is that it originated independently in several different regions. So the history is hunter-gatherers for um, the last, well, going back 10, 12,000 years ago, then getting into traditional agriculture, which was practiced for, again, several thousand years here. And um, most recently, though, in the last 50 years, industrial agriculture. I would extend this to the last 50 to 100 years, industrial agriculture. In traditional agriculture, we have agriculture by muscle power, animals, hand tools, and simple machines like you see here. There are two words that we use when talking about agriculture. One is subsistence agriculture, meaning a family produces only enough for itself to subsist their family. And intensive traditional agriculture, where a family uses animals, irrigation water, and fertilizer to produce enough to sell at the market. So, we're still using, we're still saying traditional agriculture, only it's done intensively. So what would be non-traditional would be the use of um, machinery, basically fossil fuels, things like that. So here is, this is contrasted with industrialized agriculture with the machines using the fossil fuels and synthetic fertilizers. This is a good example of monoculture, one crop. Modern intensive agriculture demands that vast fields be planted with single types of crops because there really is no other way you could get your machinery in. And monoculture is the uniform planting of a single crop. The Green Revolution we'll study more in our next unit, but for now let's say it's an intensification of industrialization of agriculture which has produced large yield increases since 1950. 
it gives increased yield per unit of land farm. So in terms of a measurement, how many how many pounds of biomass of food can you get from one acre, for example? And it began in the U.S. and other developed nations, exported to developing nations like India and those in Africa, as we sell or distribute some of our technology that we use in, in terms of specialized seeds, specialized equipment, specialized fertilizers, things like that. Soil is a complex system. So this is a stylized diagram here, but it does show that soil is a complex mixture of biotic and abiotic factors and organic and inorganic components. Um, humus, you may have heard that term, being organic components that will break down, um, mostly made up of hydrocarbons. And then inorganic compounds, meaning minerals, things like um, our nitrates and, um, and phosphates. Let's uh, just go back though that bacteria is an important component of soil. Protists also, which are single cellular organisms. And then we see a variety of insects, earthworms, etc. Fungi here also, important a component of the soil. So let's take a look at how soil is formed. Here we see a cross section of different layers of soil. Let's explore those. This starts with the parent material, the starting material that breaks down into soil. This can be bedrock, the solid rock that makes up the Earth's crust. We say bedrock because it's, it's underneath everything. And it affects the resulting soil. Example, sandstone bedrock transforms into sandy soil. And there are lots of areas around Santa Barbara where the soil is very sandy, like at my house actually. Here's a picture of some granite bedrock which over time will break down over a long period of time through weathering into soil. Let's take a look at weathering. This is the processes that break down rocks and minerals and the first step in soil formation. There are three ways this can happen. Um, so first of all, we have parent material, the rock, getting into smaller particles, eventually into smaller particles that we would refer to as soil. So the first thing is physical weathering occurring by wind, rain, thermal expansion and contraction, which can break open rock, water freezing. Um, a little bit of water gets into a pore in a rock, and then it freezes. That water expands as that occurs, breaking the rock apart. And so we talked about how important it is that water has a special property, that in ice form it is less dense and will float. Well here, because it's less dense, it means it takes up greater volume, and that can be a very strong force to break apart rock. And without that process, we might not have the soil we have today or life as we know it. Chemical weathering also occurs as water dissolves these minerals. And um, gases can also weather rock. There are some uh, areas where you have exposed iron in rock, and that will, will turn into iron oxide and um, give you a, an orangish or reddish kind of soil like we see in places like Georgia and Florida. And biological weathering, tree roots can be very strong in breaking apart rock. Even lichen can, can exert um, in biological weathering. So this process takes a long time. And the opposing force is erosion. Erosion is the movement of soil from one area to another. Well, I need to stop myself. I say opposing. It is part of the process if you have soil being made in one area it can be transported into another area where it might become a useful resource. We normally think of erosion as a bad thing though, where the soil that is in an area that's being used is, um, is moved away through the forces of nature, mostly wind and water. Let's take a look at some of the layers within soil. You, you do have to be familiar with these. So it consists of layers called horizons. And in its most simplest form, you have A, on top, the topsoil. Then you have layer B, the subsoil, and then you have layer C, the parent material. But there are other layers in here, including O, E, and R. Let's take a look at what these refer to. The O horizon is O for organic, or litter layer, example decaying leaves. So when we look here, we see all this litter, that's why we call it the organic, or O horizon. Then we have the A horizon, meaning topsoil. It's mostly inorganic minerals with some organic mat material and humus mixed in. Humus is partially decomposed litter. 
and it's crucial for plant growth. This is the really good stuff. And so that's here in our top layer, and it's always seen as being darker. Then we get into our E horizon, which means alluviation. Alluviation refers to the loss of minerals by leaching, a process whereby solid materials are dissolved by water and transported away. So some of the important minerals that might be in the water or in the soil can be dissolved by the water and then carried away as the water um, infiltrates into the ground deeper by gravity. And so here we have this E layer, which is underneath. Notice how it is not as colorful because it has lost some of its minerals. And then we get to the B horizon, the subsoil, the zone of accumulation or de deposition of leach minerals and organic acids from above. So um, what we can see here is, going back here, that minerals that are leached out of the alluviation horizon will then deposit in the B horizon. But usually that's too far away for the plant roots, so it's not really a good thing. Then we have the C horizon, slightly altered parent material, and underneath that, the R horizon referring to rock or bedrock. So here we have rock on the very bottom. And this would be rock that's uh, in the stage of weathering and this and this and that to become soil. So our parent material. Okay, let's take a look at some real pictures. Here we have the O horizon, organic matter. You can see some some debris, leaves, um, twigs, things like that, and roots as well. Underneath that, you have the A horizon, including minerals and organic matter. This is our topsoil right here. And then we have the E horizon, mineral depletion. Notice how it's lighter colored. But then we have a darker color underneath, underneath here. This is our mineral accumulation from what was leached down from the E horizon. Then we have C horizon, our parent rock. And underneath this, a little further, we get our bedrock, or R layer. So I want to give an example of this stuff we call humus. You can buy it in stores. You can add it to your soil if you're doing gardening. It's a great additive. It is mature compost. What is left when organic matter breaks down? So people who do composting, what you have left with is humus, and it's incredibly rich in nutrients. It is somewhat spongy. It helps soil to retain moisture, nutrients, and oxygen from microbes. It is dark due to carbon, and is a key component to healthy soil. We can characterize soil in different ways. We just saw the different layers, but we, it can be characterized by texture, its structure, and its pH. And here we just see some different types of soil, chalk, silt, peat, and clay. So let's start with soil texture. It's determined by the size of the particles. There are three main categories of sizes. Clay, for particles that are less than 0 0.002 millimeters in diameter. That's really, really small. This is microscopic, you know, two thousandths of a millimeter. Then we have silt. Which, is part, which are particles that are a little bit larger, up to 500 of a millimeter. Still too small to see with the naked eye. Then we have sand, um, which is particles that can be up to 2 millimeters in diameter. 2 millimeters, we can definitely picture that. They'd be like um, the size of like, um, you know, the lead on the tip of a pencil, for example. The best for plant growth is loam soil, which is an even mix of these three types. And we'll do soil texture um, determination in our lab um, in our next class period. But you'll, you'll get to see what, how your soil is composed. Is it mostly sand, mostly clay, mostly silt, or a nice mix of the three? There's something called a soil texture triangle that you'll learn how to read. And let's just say that each side of this triangle represents silt, clay, or sand. And within that, you have um, areas that represent um, the composition of it. We'll be doing a whole exercise with this, but um, for now let me give you an example. If our composition was loam, like right here, that would mean that it is 20% clay, 50% sand, and 30% silt. And these all need to add up to 100%. We can also 
um, characterize soil by its structure, meaning a measure of the clumpiness of the soil. Some soils are a little bit more compacted, some are a little bit more loose and open. Um, this is not as big of a concept as soil texture. And soil pH, the degree of acidity or alkalinity which influences a, a, which influences a soil's ability to support plant growth. Low pH is acidic, high pH is alkaline or basic. It's mostly determined by the type of bedrock that forms the soil. For example, limestone produces alkaline soils. It is also influenced by rainfall and the type of vegetation. Some plants give off um, debris and litter that can acidify the soil. Each type of plant has its preferred pH. And uh, blueberry plants like low pH, just a little FYI. Whereas asparagus like um, as a typo, asparagus like high pH. Now let's take a look at two very different types of soil. Soil we find in the Amazon is what we call rain, well, rainforest soil. And notice it has a very thin topsoil. And that's because lots of rain which leaches nutrients from the topsoil down and out of reach of root plants. And nutrients not leached are taken up by lush vegetation, leaving little in the soil. And when this soil is farmed, it gives out after a few years. Alright, so here's the topsoil, very thin, that's the key point. And underneath that, really not many, not many nutrients. Most of the nutrients are store, stored in the vegetation up here, which when these plants die and decay, those nutrients will return back to the topsoil. Contrast this with Kansas prairie soil which is, has topsoil that's very rich and productive. Uh, and you can see a much thicker layer here of dark soil. And this is partly because low rainfall keeps the nutrients in the topsoil, where plants take them up and recycle them back into soil when they die. So we don't have the same level of rainfall, which would be leaching away the minerals, so we have a higher mineral content. There's a type of agriculture that's common in, rain, in rainforest regions called swidden or slash and burn. And uh, this just simply means tropical forests is cut. The plot is farmed for one to two years, and the farmer moves on to clear another plot, leaving the first to regrow into forest. So we're slashing the vegetation. We're usually burning it to actually remove um, you know, every little bit of it. And that, that process of burning actually can help to um, fertilize the soil from the minerals that were in the vegetation um, as they burn. Um, this ha has sort of a, a negative connotation to it because we see it now where a situation of deforestation, this is really, um, this is more traditional where you might have had a low population density where it became a sustainable practice. You know, you, you grow in for one to two years, you move on to another area and grow on that for one to two years. By the time you're coming back around after a while to this original area, it's, it is then regrown into forest and you can repeat the process. But the problem is if this is done at too high of a rate, it's not sustainable. And as you can see with it, you're going to have lots of examples of um, or opportunities for erosion and things like that. Okay, I would like you to write a summary of the notes of um, write a summary at the end of your notes. And um, I'll see you in class tomorrow.